You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 80 of the Common Descent Podcast, and happy Darwin Day. Happy Darwin Day. Darwin Day is a day that science and sciencey nerds all around the world celebrate uh, science, scientists, and the work, past, present, and future, that allows us to understand the natural world. And it commemorates the birthday of one Charles Darwin. We've talked about him. We have. His birthday's on February 12th. Two years ago, we did Darwin Day with our friend Dr. Sarah Bray Mm -hmm. in an episode about Darwin himself, episode 28. Last year, episode 54, again with Dr. Sarah Bray, was about Alfred Russell Wallace, the other evolution guy. Yeah. And this year, we are continuing our tradition of talking about historical figures with Mary Anning. Which is cool. I'm excited. Yeah, and it, Well, and it's another one that it's about time for a Mary Anning episode. I feel like that's going to be one of those... Every time we get to a new Darwin Day, it will be about time we've talked about probably whoever we're talking <laughs> about, because there's a lot of cool people. <laughs> so Mary Anning is famous for many things, predominantly being one of the first modern paleontologists mm-hmm. in the very early 1800s, before the word dinosaur existed, before Darwin came around, before Darwin was born. Well, some of it was before Darwin. She was alive before Darwin was born. But before Darwin was famous. Yeah. She was one of the people that sort of set the stage for our modern methods, our modern understanding of ancient life. Mary Anning is also famous for how not famous she was yeah. at her time. Being a woman, being not particularly wealthy at all in the time and just not part of the high standing scientific community. But these days she has received a resurgence in popularity, in part because people are starting to talk about her. And also in keeping with tradition, we will be joined this episode by a special guest. Yay! This time, fellow science communicator, museum educator, Cenozoic paleontologist, and just all-around cool person, Brittany Stoneberg. She's pretty awesome. We're very excited to have her with us. So after the news, after that break, we will be joined by Brittany Hey, one other thing. This episode I did didn't just come out of nowhere. It didn't. It was requested by a bunch of people, Josh and Greta, and our patrons, Finley, Tawny, Catherine, and Simon, who managed to suggest the episode about an hour after we finished recording the discussion section with Brittany. (laughs) So thanks for the great suggestions, everyone. Good suggestions. Before we get into the episode, just a couple of quick announcements. Number one, we have a Patreon. Our patrons get all sorts of cool bonus goodies, including many of our patrons will be able to hear after this episode a bonus recording after chat that we will... Just a little bit of extra discussion that we have with Brittany after the episode. Patrons of a certain level also get shoutouts like this. This time, thank you for joining us to Laura, Saul... Joshua, Curtis, Scott, Rita, and Brett. Whew. Welcome, everyone. We're pretty popular on the internet. <laughs> Speaking of being popular on the internet, one other very quick announcement. Uh, we're on Instagram now. Hey, we heard about this new site, this all the, new app. All the kids are doing it. I mean, it's brand new from what I understand. It's only been around recently enough. Otherwise, we surely would have been on it before Naturally. now. Uh, and yeah, so we're we're going to be trying to post on there for, <laughs> as often as we're able. So if you're on Instagram and you'd like to follow us on Instagram, do it. Otherwise, we're still on Facebook and Twitter, and we post our stuff on YouTube, so keep up with us on the internets. Well, that's enough announcements. A nice short one this time. Let's go into the news. News! Every episode, we pick a couple of recent newses from paleontology, evolution, subjects we like, subjects we hope you will like. And discuss what's new. So, Will, what's new? I have some news about Paleoloxodon. What? The straight tusk elephants. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm on board. Did we discuss Paleoloxodon at all in episode 66 about elephants? We did indeed. These were the ones that were famous for having 
very long tusks, but also being big. Not all of them. Enormous. But the big ones are big. Well, this is some research looking at the diversity of species in uh, particularly Europe and uh, India, but in general, the Eurasian uh, continent and trying to figure out exactly how, how distinct different species are of Paleoloxodon. So this is research by Asier Loramendi et al. in the Quaternary Science Reviews, and the press release is from the University of Bristol. And this is looking at the distribution of Paleoloxodon after they spread out from Africa. So okay. they st- you know, the history of elephants starts in Africa. Well, Paleoloxodon is no different. And about 800,000 years ago, they migrated out of Africa and spread across Europe and Asia. Uh, became fairly successful. Lots of distinct species in those areas. A couple of dwarf species, which yeah, we mentioned. <laughs> so, you know, even ones going from uh, all the way out to Japan. Ooh. So widespread, fairly distinct. One of the features of these Paleoloxodon that has uh, been used to tr- try to distinguish these is a fairly unique crest on the skull. Uh, as they described, a headband-like crest across the brow. Oh, cool. Like a brow ridge Basically, yeah. Very hmm. brow ridge-esque. And it can range from fairly d- distinguished to a really notable brow. Wow. The European species was typically recognized to have a fairly slightly built, you know, or slight crest, not not too robust. While the Indian species was notable for having a, as they put it, extremely robust skull crest. So that had been a trend there uh, in the history of research for these elephants. They think part of the reason for the crests is because their heads were also notably big, Mm-hmm. among elephants and that it may have been attachment for more muscle right if you have to hold up not only a giant head but huge straight tusks yes you need all this extra attachment uh they said some of the largest skulls could be four and a half feet tall Ooh. from the top to the base of the tusk sheets sheets wow so a meter and a half tall big skulls well this research uh was kicked off by some skulls in italy and germany that have almost the exact same crest as the Indian forms, so could be a single species. So they did some research looking at uh, a number of specimens to try to figure out what exactly is the trend. And the trends that they decided to look for were those that had to do with the age, the development of the crest. Okay, so not age geologically, but age from young to adult. Individually. No, so, ontog- ontogenetically. Yes, ontogeny. Episode 33. And we can do this very easily with elephants because they have the molar replacement as a group. That is, they replace molars from the back and push the old ones out the front, which means depending on what molars they have, you can tell pretty you know, pretty precisely what stage of life they were in. Yeah, they have a conveyor belt of teeth. Marching molars, my favorite biological term. I love it so much. (laughs) So they found some cool trends. Uh, The first one had to do with the development of the crest in that it, with age, it becomes more distinct. At young ages for juveniles, it's very small, not protruding beyond the forehead. While with young adults, it starts to protrude more and with the older individuals it is now as they put stout Uh, so so not perhaps not a species difference but an age difference that's what i was thinking when i was reading it but they said it still became clear that the indian and the european are distinct oh okay even with all of this that even with the european skulls that had the most pronounced crests uh of, of the oldest individuals the skull roof never becomes as thickened as the Indian species. Okay, so it's there are still differences, yes, but that one feature might not be as surefire a difference. Exactly. So there's there's more diversity, uh, but it does look like those are distinct, 
so that they did have two separate species uh, in Europe and Asia, in India. It also seemed that skull material found in Asia and in East Africa represented distinct groups, and they said that they might be more evolutionarily conservative because they also had less pronounced crests, which are similar to the earliest paleoloxodons. Right, right. So this feature could be a more ancestral trait for ones that have less exaggerated crests. Oh, okay. And the crest is something that certain groups developed over time. And got developed more extremely. Interesting. Anytime I hear about a feature that develops most prominently as an adult, mm -hmm. I, wor I wonder about if it is related to maturity. Yep. Is this a sexual, either sexual display or because your elephants, as we were talking about muscle attachment, is it that now you're strong so you can fight each other? Yeah. What is that? I wonder, I'd be curious to know if they could tell male versus female. Yes. If that feature differs or if it is something that all adults are using for various reasons. Or if it's, uh, if it, like you said, if it's muscle attachment, it makes me wonder if another feature is matur maturing right. at an extreme rate, like tusks. Like tusks, yep. That you don't need them because you don't have big tusks as a baby, but by an adult, your tusks have reached an important stage where you need to use them. And yes. now you need that extra attachment. Yeah, because it could, it could be not just for fighting, but like when you reach max size, you are now a tree destroyer. Yes. Like you, you have unlocked the skill of knocking down trees. Well, it's a new niche. Yes. You're not behaving the way you were when you were smaller. Interesting. Yeah. I, it, I love studies like this because they zoom in super close on one group of elephants. Mm -hmm. Not all of elephants, this one particular branch. Which is always fun to, to see the different scales. Well, that's that's something I always tell people when like because I've had young people who are like I want to I, I want to get into science, and I've had one I've had uh, individuals who have told me before that they're kind of hesitant though because they feel like the cool stuff has been discovered, you mm -hmm. know, or that they're like I don't know that there'd be a place for me, you know, is there a place a spot where I could make a, a, a niche for myself. And I'm like, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what you're talking about, yes, I've I I was blown away when I got into academia and realized how far you could zoom in. Yeah. So no, you can find stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of cool discoveries and not having found all the coolest stuff, last episode was episode 79 about pterosaurs, mm -hmm. and it was a long time coming. And we got all excited that right, right before we recorded the episode, a whole new study came out about pterosaur trackways. Yeah, it was very convenient. Well, right after we <laughs> released the episode, another new study came out about pterosaur feeding traces. This is research by Renee Hoffman et al. in Scientific Reports. And we'll link to an article in Science News by John Pickerel. Also, I'm going to fetch for just a second here. I had to go digging to find Renee Hoffman's first name because Scientific Reports apparently is in the habit of just listing first initials yeah. in the author yep, yep, list. Yep. And I've been seeing this recently. And for whatever it's worth, Scientific Journals, stop that. I hate it. No, it's... I want to know the names of the people because they're humans and I want to treat them as such. Like, I can understand if you're, like, trying to save space when you print it. But on the website, yeah, give us, the all, <laughs> give us all the information, please. So this is a new fossil that came from the Solenhofen limestone in Germany. Very famous site. Late Jurassic, around 150 million years old. Uh, ancient tropical sea type region. Famous for fossils of dinosaurs. Archaeopteryx came from here. Go back to episode 37. Nice. The quote unquote first bird. And pterosaur fossils are very famous from this area. But the new study is not about a pterosaur fossil. Okay. It's about a squid. Hey, we talked about those two. We did. Episode 16, cephalopods. What cool stuff are you going to tell us about squids? I'm going to tell you about it. I'm on the diet. Oh, okay. This squid, I mean, that's pretty much all we talked about. <laughs> was about... 30 centimeters long, right. so a foot. That's, would, a, that's a, a moderate size for a squid. Yeah, that, that's bigger than most. Notable for being a perfectly preserved, fully grown, soft tissue specimen. Wow. So, right, squids do not have bones. 
but we got this outline and even some details of like where the ink sac is. It's one of those like <gasps> gorgeously preserved specimens. You can see lots and lots of details of a species known as Plesiotuthis subovata. But what makes the squid even more interesting, especially for us vertebrate folks, is that the mantle of the squid, which is the head part, kind of. It's, yeah, the, the torpedo-looking section. Has a tooth stuck in it. <laughs> it's awesome. The, the mantle is phosphatized, right? It's mineralized, it's fossilized, and the tooth is jammed into it, which the authors note right off the bat, probably not just something that happened by accident, because this depositional setting is extremely calm water. Mm -hmm. So it's not like there was a lot of movement and stuff. It, unlikely that in the fossilization process, it got stuck in there. Which led them to go searching for a tooth match, like a forensic scientist's. The size and shape of the tooth, there are lots of different animals known to have lived in this time, marine animals and more, but the size and shape are very reminiscent of pterosaurs. Woo! And more specifically, it appears to be a close match to the morphology of Rampharynchus munsteri. <gasps> cool. So in the last episode, we talked about Rampharynchus was a very, very famous, relatively small, so wingspan, I think, like a meter, fairly small, long tail with a little diamond mm -hmm. nightcrawler style vein at the end of it, which has been found in other cases with fish remains in its guts and stuff. So we know that Rampharynchus hunted aquatic prey. That it was a fisher. Not only that, but Rampharynchus is preserved so abundantly that we the, the authors were able to, by comparing to what we know about our bajillion other Rampharynchus specimens, for pterosaurs, very abundant, that it was a mature individual <laughs> who left this single tooth, not a young one, but an adult, and it was a front or middle tooth. <laughs> that's so cool. Not like back of the jaw. It was one either up front or in the middle. Which makes sense because that's what you'd be snapping at a squid with. Especially if you if you missed it for it to then get fossilized. Yep. <laughs> so this appears to be a case where a pterosaur, Rampharynchus, broke a tooth off biting a squid. Now, as always, there's always the big question of was this scavenging or predation? And in this case, the authors say scavenging is probably not super likely for a couple of reasons. One, that the squid was eventually buried in the very deep oxygen poor waters mm -hmm. of the area. And it's not likely that the pterosaur dove down to get it in the bottom. Mm -hmm. But also that it's a lot less likely seeming that you would lose a tooth in a carcass. Yes. Because carcasses are softer. And they don't struggle. They don't fight back. Yeah, they don't try to get away. Yes. So it looks like a pterosaur bit tried to catch this squid, didn't end up catching it, a quote, failed predation attempt, and lost a tooth in the process in the squid. That's really cool. Yeah, it's a it's an awesome find. If like, And this would be one of those where I don't know that there's any way for us to confirm but it also raises the question of, is the tooth what caused the death of the squid? They mention that. Yeah. And they mention it just enough to say, yeah, we don't know. Yeah. Because, I mean, how, how, how would you confirm? I, I guess you could, in theory, find evidence of, like, infection or something. Yeah. Or if you, if you have it well-preserved enough to see that it's like, yeah, no, there's the tooth. That's the heart. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, there it is. Well, I have this image in my head. I prefer... With no evidence at all to back it up. The idea of it being like that alligator that with, with a knife in its yes, head. Yeah. Or like every now and then we'll see a whale that's got a harpoon yeah. from like 50 years ago. This was just a, a grizzled old squid with a tooth <laughs> sticking out of it. <laughs> One of the reasons this is super interesting is if you've listened to episode 79, you'll know that there's lots of discussion about how pterosaurs ate. This suggests to the authors that this pterosaur was most likely snapping at food from above the water. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Either flying over it or maybe less likely f sitting on the water like some seabirds do. Although we discussed last episode that pterosaurs probably weren't doing that nearly as acrobatically yes. as birds do today. So there's 
a lot of layers to this one. It's it's not only evidence of what a pterosaur tried to eat, but perhaps of how it tried to eat it. That's very cool. I, I also want to make the final note that in the article, the, 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 the science news article, I believe it was, they quote Mike Habib, who's a pterosaur researcher, as saying that this squid was probably too big yeah. for a Ramphorhynchus to, like, haul out of the water. So it could have been a failed predation attempt because it literally tried to bite off more than it could chew. Yeah, it's it was overambitious. <laughs> so there you go. That's all the pterosaur news. Now stop discovering pterosaur things. We already did the episode. Yeah, the episode's done. All right, we're past it. We're moving on. And we're moving on to some footprints. Okay, well, those are cool. Yeah. Not more pterosaur footprints. No, no. No, at least not not as far as they can tell. Okay. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> These are some footprints from South Africa that the the title of the articles you'll see are calling them firewalkers. Yeah. Because the footprint the the layer of sediment the footprints are preserved in is sandwiched between two layers of volcanic rock. Yes. So it's pretty cool. This is researched by Amis Bordy et al. in Plus One. And the article is written by Yasmin Saplakoglu in Live Science. So these are some dinosaur footprints, or mostly dinosaur footprints, it seems, found in South Africa. Uh, They were actually discovered by accident when one of the researchers was going through an unpublished master's dissertation from 1964. Wow. And an (laughs) image of one of the prints was in there, and it caught their attention as something unique to go look at so they went to south africa's karoo basin and this is a place known for both uh, mesozoic fossils but also igneous rocks it's very famous from lava flows during the jurassic period and they discovered 25 footprints from five trackways these footprints were preserved in sandstone which is pretty common to preserve footprints between two basalt layers. These are the igneous rocks. Right, those are massive flows of lava. Mm -hmm. We've talked in many of our extinction episodes about large igneous province basalts. Yes. Where you just have these sheets of lava pouring out of volcanoes over long periods of time. This is sandwiched between two of those. So it's in between two periods where the area they're discovering them in was covered by... Liquid hot lava. Lava. (laughs) Where the floor was lava. Literally. These footprints date to 183 million years old to what would have been a a stream with wet sandy banks. Looking at the footprints, measuring the sizes and lengths between them, they were able to identify a few different uh, uh, types of dinosaur and animal. That would have left them. They compared them to other similar trackways. Some of the footprints are go to some large carnivorous dinosaur. So something theropod, the two-legged predatory dinosaurs. Cool. They also had some from smaller four-footed herbivorous dinosaurs, most likely herbivorous. Also cool. And then some that were more vague that may have been synapsids. Ooh, early ancestors of mammals. Exactly. Or, at that point, maybe true mammals. Yeah, potentially. Episode 47. Now, the herbivore, or the potential herbivore, the one with four footprints to its body, not two, may be a new ichnospecies. Ooh, a new species of footprint. Yes, and so ichnospecies, once again, are the names we give to trace fossils, since we can't for sure match it up to a body fossil. They named it Afro Delatericness Ellen Bergeri. So, that's cool. And the species name, Ellen Bergeri, is after Paul Ellenberger, a French priest and trace fossil expert who is considered to be the father of vertebrate ichnology in southern Africa. Oh, that's cool. Right? Oh, that's pr- neat. That's a pretty cool name. <laughs> The interesting part of where the footprints are is those two basalt layers suggest that this was an area that f- from time to time was covered by lava, a.k.a. inhospitable. Yes. And that these footprints were left in a time between lava flows, 
that was evidently long enough for the ecosystem to have bounced back enough to have plant remains, which they have, and predator and prey and a variety of animals. So they don't know how long that time was, but this gives an interesting bit of info for this area during this time of the Jurassic that it was a place where it was bouncing back potentially multiple times from these lava flows. And we got footprints in one of those in-between sections. Very cool. Hence the name Firewalkers. Firewalkers. There is a... I remember this paper. I got to read through some of this paper. Because, fun fact, uh, with this is a paper published in PLOS, there is a press release released through PLOS. And I wrote the press release for this one. So I remember this paper. (laughs) And there is an image, an artistic image associated with the paper of these creatures walking around in a world on fire mm-hmm. it's like there is bu- repeated volcanic activity going on in the same region that they are walking around with cool implications for how ecosystems deal with dramatic and sometimes catastrophic environmental shifts very cool yeah well speaking of ecosystems bouncing back and starting up i have another study My second bit of news is about hints at the early organisms that made life as we know it possible. Cool. Specifically, fossil fungi. Oh, nice. This is research by Steve Bonneville et al. in Science Advances, and we'll link to an article in National Geographic by Douglas Main. So fungi are pretty important. They are. Way more important than you would think by how often we talk about them on the podcast. Yeah. Not a lot of fungus fossils out there. Sorry, everybody. Sorry, fungus fans. (laughs) Fungi are important as decomposers, right? They they specialize in breaking down dead stuff, and so they help cycle nutrients through ecosystems. But they're also a major ingredient in soils. Yes. And in fact, most land plants have symbiotic relationships with fungi, that help them all survive and gather nutrients from the soil. Fungi have long been considered probably an essential piece, not only of plant-based ecosystems today, but the earliest movement of plants onto land. Yeah. So understanding the history of fungi can be important for understanding the world we have today. Fungi are estimated to have branched off from their closest relatives, animals. Yeah. At least one billion years ago, but the fossil record of fungi, that is based, uh, I believe, on molecular evidence, Mm -hmm. DNA, but fossil evidence of fungi is sorely lacking. As mentioned in the paper, the oldest reported fungus fossils prior to this study are Middle Ordovician, so around 460 million years ago. Which, I mean, that's going back a bit. Not too shabby. There was a paper that came out last year, just several months ago, that found what might have been microbial fungus remains in Canada at a billion years old, but that still wow. new and disputed. This new study splits the difference <laughs> with fungus fossils that aren't quite that old, but are better resolved in the evidence that suggests they are fungi. Cool. These fossils were found in shale from the Congo, dating to around 715 to 810 million years ago. Somewhere in that range. To put you into perspective, that's well before the earliest animal fossil remains. Yeah. Episode 31, we talked about the Ediacaran biota. The earliest apparently animal, macroscopic animal fossils. This is well before that. That kicks off at like 630 or so million years ago. So these are very, very old fungi. If fungi indeed, going on twice as old as those Middle Ordovician ones. There are a few reasons why they think they may have found actual fungus fossils in this shale. One is the size and shape of what they found. They found the preserved remains of branching filaments that are around 5 micrometers thick. (sighs) Very tiny. Five whole micrometers. Five whole micrometers. My God. So if if you're familiar with fungi, you may know that the main body of fungus is not mushrooms and stuff. It tends to be what's called mycelium, which is this branching network of, it's not roots, 
because it's mycelium. Yes. But it's these thread-like networks that s- spread out through the soil and yeah, such. Very like a web of fungal tissue. And then every now and then they form those mushroom fruiting bodies that you see. Yes, that pop up above the ground. The rest of the fungus is all throughout every bit of soil basically you ever walk on. <laughs> so these filaments are about the right size and shape and morphology for fungi. But there are other animals that do filaments. You can have bacterial filaments mm-hmm. and such. So they did some chemical analyses. And the analysis found, number one, similar chemical structure to eukaryotic organisms, which are your plants, fungi, animals but also protozoans, which come in a variety of forms, and multiple chemical techniques detected the presence of chitin. There you go. (laughs) So chitin is a particular type of protein that is mainly found in arthropods, so insect exoskeletons, crustaceans, things like that. A, A few other animals can produce chitin and fungi. Yes. It is a famous characteristic component of fungal cells. It's it's one of those key evidences that show you that fungus is more like us than a plant. Yes, it is, because plants do not make chitin, to my knowledge. I don't think there are plants with chitin. Uh, not that I know of. So, fungal-like filaments, eukaryotic organism, it seems, and the evidence of chitin are... Uh, that is some pretty strong supporting evidence that what you have found is true fungus. Now, it probably isn't going to be convincing to everybody Mm -hmm. because, again, this is not the oldest fossil fungus by, like, 10 million years. It's the oldest fossil fungus by hundreds of millions of years from a time period that is notoriously difficult to study. Yes. So, we'll see. But if they are fungus, the authors suggest that they most likely lived along the edge of a lake, either just outside the water or just underneath the water. Yeah. Yeah likely decomposing, feeding on decaying algae or cyan, you know, cyanobacteria, something like that, based on the sediments that they found them in. And this has some really interesting implications for our understanding of the colonization of land. Not only is it just always cool to see evidence of the early evolution of a particular group, but fungi are a huge deal for land colonization. As I mentioned, they form symbiotic relationships with plants, which allow plants in large part to colonize the land. Mm -hmm. But they also form very famously symbiotic relationships with algae. Yes, they do. Lichens are a symbiosis between fungus and algae or similar things, which are typically the first things that can colonize entirely barren space. Yeah, they are... The terror formers. Like, yeah. They turn rocky, bare land into things that can start hosting soil and other organisms. So there is some discussion in the paper about whether or not these fungi could have been living already in a symbiotic relationship with early algae mm-hmm. on or near land. And if so, these fossils from this time period and others that hopefully maybe are waiting to be found could have a lot of interesting evidence to show us to tell us about how fungi started how they started getting onto land and what set the foundations for the colonization of land by plants and animals hundreds of millions of years after this point that's really cool microbial fossils are not always the most exciting to look at no and if we're being honest they're not always the most exciting news because a lot of t- it's it's a controversial. We're not yes. sure. It's chemical evidence. It's so early, like these, that that it's difficult to draw clear implications mm-hmm. from what it means. And a lot of times, it can be kind of technical. And a lot of times, it can kind of feel like, oh, they found some microbe fossils. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yes, but I do like when we get to mention them every now and then because we have probably spent maybe twenty full minutes of podcast time ever talking about fungi. Yep. So it's good to give them a shout out now and then. Well, and, and this is a cool study. Yes, it is. And it's nice to mention, you know, things like fungi or, you know, microbes and bacteria and things because without those things, nothing else works. Yeah. Like there there's not an ecosystem I can think of that does not need at least one of those and usually more than one of those to function. 
So they're really important. They're a big part of what has allowed our Earth to change in the ways it has. So listeners, if you want us to learn more about fungi and then tell you what we learned, yeah. tell us to do a fungus episode. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of pioneering organisms... <laughs> Technically, <laughs> Marianne was both a pioneer and an organism. This is the art of the segue. We will wrap up the news and move on into our discussion of Marianne, her life, her history, and the impact she had on our favorite field of science, paleontology, after the break, where we will be joined by our friend Brittany. Can't wait for her to get here. Stay tuned. Hi, Brittany. Hello. How are you guys doing? Doing well. Good. Thank you for joining us on this episode. Oh, yeah, of course. Well, we are excited to have you. But before we talk about our main uh, topic, please introduce yourself for our listeners. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Brittany Stoneberg. I am the Outreach and Communications Coordinator for the Western Science Center, which is a natural history museum in Hemet, California. Um, so Southern California, east of Los Angeles, west of Palm Springs, kind of right in the middle there. <laughs> And I am also a uh, currently a master's student in environmental studies at uh, California State University, Fullerton. Very, Very cool. nice. And you're studying horses? Right now, right? yes. I am just finishing okay. up my first research paper on Miocene horses, which are those um, interesting little three-toed horses. I call them My Little Ponies um, <laughs> for a, a, a childhood reference. Um, and eventually I'd like to move on to, uh, research on Pacific Mastodon. So, uh, my boss, Dr. Alton Dooley, um, with his co-authors named the Pacific Mastodon, uh, based on the material here at the Western Science Center. And so I'm quite interested in starting to learn more about those animals and the environment they lived in. So that's the hope. Cool. Very nice. And our listeners can't see this, but we are on <laughs> Skype and there is Mastodon behind you. <laughs> Yes, there is. As you're sitting um, in the collections room. I am. I needed a quiet spot to record this interview, <laughs> and the conference room was booked, so I just kind of squirreled away in the collections, uh, which is quite apt for. It's also Fossil Friday today. So yes, yes I'm, I am conducting this interview in the pro in the presence of over 100,000 fossils. Wow. Also a fitting for this being our Darwin Day episode. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> museum collection. So it's, it's, a, it's a great situation all around. <laughs> So we, you're here today to talk with us about Mary Annie. I am, and I'm very excited to do so. And we're excited to have you. We're going to start to go through the whole story of Mary, but first, very briefly, for any of our listeners who don't know, who is Mary Annie and why does she deserve a whole episode? What about Mary? <laughs> I had to get so, it out of the way. Okay, and now, and now it's done. yeah. Got it. You have to do it early. Um, so Mary Annie is. Um, basically one of the first recognized female paleontologists, kind of want to make that distinction. Um, she made a lot of paleontological discoveries that really shaped our understanding of England in particular, but really geologic history as it stands as a whole. Um, and so she's really kind of an ambassador for women in science and women in paleontology. And there are so many amazing paleontologists that we recognize that are, uh, let's face it, male. Um, this is very, this is a very male dominated profession. And it's very cool, I think, to see a woman in the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, making so many discoveries. Um, and so that's kind of who Mary Annie is. She is a prolific fossil hunter. And she was definitely one of the first female paleontologists. Very cool. Excellent. So let's start by setting the stage. As you said, this is you know, turn of the 1800s, what is the world like that Mary is born into? Yeah. What are science and society like then? So one of the biggest things is uh, apt again for uh, the occasion of Darwin Day. This is before the publication of Origin of Species. Um, she was born almost 50 years, like about 50 years prior to the publication of Origin of Species. So you have this world that is still very religious, very um, concerned with the uh, six days of creation. Um, Mary Annie herself was um, was very religious. And so you're and you're kind of in this world that's just on the cusp of really beginning to understand 
uh, fossil history and paleontology. Uh, the description of me Megalosaurus, for example, um, which is, you know, the first descript, uh, described dinosaur didn't come out until 1824. And Mary Annan was born in 1799. So she's really about to come of age in this period of discovery and wonder. Wow. Yeah. What a time. Uh, it's, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's always fun when we get to go back this far in the history of paleontology to where it's like, it wasn't even really a, a fully fledged thing yet. And that's, that's exciting. That's cool. Oh yeah. Well, if I, it's around this time that extinction is just starting to be recognized as a thing that happens mm -hmm. and that fossils are starting to be recognized as what fossils are, is that they are <laughs> the, as fossils. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's really an interesting time and she's really, Mary Anning is, you know, uh, you'll often see her described as a fossil hunter because, you know, at that time, you know, like you said, paleontology was just coming into its own. People were collecting fossils all the time, but not understanding exactly what they had quite yet. So sometimes you'll see her described as a paleontologist, as a fossil hunter. Um, I definitely see her as a paleontologist because she made scientific discoveries and inferences and hypotheses. So, but it was definitely in this time where paleontology as a science was just really being born. Yeah, so that that uh, the terminology wasn't quite there yet. Yeah, exactly. To even be applied. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. If she were around today, she'd be a big deal. Yes, mm -hmm. she'd yes. be a paleontologist. She mm -hmm. would be, you know, I'd like leading to think so. <laughs> studies. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Mary's born into this earliest eighteen hundreds world. What is her, before we get into, you know, her work with fossils and such, what is her upbringing like? Well, she's, you know, she's born in this time that's just very tumultuous and also kind of poverty stricken. So um, she was one of 10 children. Um, her most famous sibling is uh, Joseph Anning. Um, however, her and Joseph were the only two of their siblings that survived to adulthood, um, which is quite common for that age, you would have a lot of children because there was no guarantee that all of them would survive to adulthood. It's actually kind of surprising that Mary Anning's one of the ones who survived because um, when she was an infant, she was actually struck by lightning. Uh, oh, and she, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she survived. And uh, later on, it does seem like this is kind of, this incident is, ha, is attributed a little bit to her, her vast knowledge and her ability to find these fossils, um, <laughs> which is... Of course, it, ha it has to be. She was struck by lightning. It can't just be that she was smart. Well, it gave her superpowers. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's, is. This is her origin story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So she was struck by lightning as a child. But yeah, still her and Joseph were the only um, two children um, of their parents that survived to adulthood. So she was really born into this poor family. Her father died when she was 10 or 11. Um, and so her dad was a cabinet maker and that didn't always pay the bills. So he's actually, uh, their father was the one who started collecting fossils and selling them uh, on on the beach and on the, um, like when people would come into town, you would sell fossils to them and what, curios, really. It's just curiosities for people from out of town, for tourists. Mm -hmm. um, so almost like a tourist trap. And right. <laughs> that was kind of how you supplemented your income. And lots of people used to do that because uh, where Mary Anning was born is um, Lyme Regis. Um, it's in the southwest of England in Dorset, and it's incredibly fossil rich. Um, it's Jurassic. Um, I believe the formation is the um, the Jurassic Blue Lias formation. So you have this incredibly rich area that's just full of fossils. Um, and so her family was one of several that were collecting those fossils, selling them to museums and other institutions, and also selling them to tourists who would come through town. And that's really how she kind of supplemented any income um it's just a very poor poor area and that area is still famous for fossils today oh yeah right mm -hmm. this is on the the famous jurassic coast mm -hmm. and yeah. so you have all this site. old marine sediments which will be important <laughs> <laughs> in, <laughs> yes. in regards to the sorts of things Mary's spoiler finding. alert um, right <laughs> yeah so it's still an area where you can still find plenty of fossils today um so it was a a great area for Mary Anning to be born in. She was really born into this area where she was surrounded by these ancient creatures. Very cool. I was doing a little bit of reading. I, I mean, I, I kind of know the Mary Anning yeah. story. So I did a little bit <laughs> of diving in before this. And there is a lot of death in her upbringing. Like yeah. eight siblings. Mm -hmm. 
and her father. Uh, there's also another story, which I will leave it to you if you want to bring it up. <laughs> well, yeah. <later. laughs> I mean, well, we can we can do it now. Her her dog died. Um, yeah. <laughs> which is which is I think it's the true tragedy. I would just be I beside say, well, now myself. I'm sad. Yeah. Well, he so, was her fossil hunting buddy. Mm-hmm. So uh, she had a dog Trey, which was uh, one of a long tradition of fossil hunting dogs who would help mm-hmm. her. And again, you said it's you know it's the Jurassic coastline, so it's jagged rocks and cliff sides, and it's actually a very dangerous area, um, especially during storms. And um, there was a rock slide that almost killed Mary. Um, I believe it was in 1833 when this happened, and she almost died, but her dog definitely died. Um, and so Trey was tragically killed in a rock slide while helping her hunt for fossils, which just tears me up. Wow. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. so sad. Yeah, she didn't. Marianne did not have a easy life, um, especially as we get further <laughs> in, as we get further into it. Um, sh- which I think makes some of her discoveries and her persistence in making those discoveries all the more admirable. She didn't. I think she so. she did it throughout her life. So even when her life got tragic, she was still going out and finding fossils. Part of that was out of necessity. That is how she made her livelihood. But Mary on- Mary Annie definitely also had a passion for this sort of thing and was fueled by her wish for scientific discovery, I feel. So as as a child, so, you know, obviously not a great upbringing. <laughs> by the time she is a preteen, her father has passed away. Um, so let, let's talk a bit. We'll get into sort of her specific discoveries, but what did adult Mary then end up doing? Um, she ended up opening up her own curio shop. She uh, started selling fossils to scientists, to museums, and museums really started buying them from her. So she never quite made a comfortable, rich living in terms of monetary value, but she was starting to make income not only from her curio shop, but also from selling the finds that she did discover to other institutions, um, which played into some of her obscurity um, in history, as we'll, we'll get further into it. Interesting. And it's, it's, it's kind of funny because nowadays there is a, uh, you know, a, a significant debate on selling fossils Mm -hmm. within the fossil community. I was thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. Of like, nowadays there's, there are, there are heated discussions, Mm -hmm. you know, at times about the moral aspects of that and whether it is or isn't, you know, worth the, the risk to the fossils. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's kind of funny that a person who is very important to fossil history made her living doing that. Yeah, it's it's an interesting dichotomy. You have to think about it in the world world that she lived in as well. But at mm-hmm. least I, I I keep thinking I'm like at least it was being sold to museums and to institutions. Um, if we had to sell fossils, well, I'm glad they went to a place that was able to care for them and describe them. But yeah, it's an interesting way of looking at it and kind of shows how much our field has changed. Mm -hmm. Uh, These are things that we probably, you know, again, like you said, it's hotly debated now whether or not fossil selling is permissible or even moral or all of these different things. But back when paleontology was first starting, it was a completely different world and you had completely different circumstances and factors going into what happened to a fossil and who Mm -hmm. got to look at a fossil. Mary Annie is one of the few women at this time who were working on fossils, and a lot of her work would end up going to men who would describe the fossils that she found. Um, so, she, so that's another part is just who has access to these fossils. Mm-hmm. Mary Annie was the one digging them up, going through all of the labor of trying to protect the fossil, get it ready um, and out of the ground. And but she's not the one who described any of them. Or who got the scientific yeah. credit um, until much, much later for finding these fossils. So it's, yeah, it's a it's a thorny issue. It's a, it's one of those really complex gray areas, I think, in our field. Yeah, Absolutely. I think so. Absolutely. Well, and, and at that time, you know, it was, like you said, she's selling them as curios, as this is a, a cool, these are basically, they're cool rocks. Yeah. yeah. As it got and further as... on, it she definitely started to understand what she had. And, right, right. And it would be more of a, I have found this amazing uh, scientific discovery, and I'm going to sell it to a scientist who will take it and describe it and do things with it. Um, but yeah, back when it started, you know, when you're selling things uh, off the road to a tourist who's coming through town, it's definitely framed as more of a curio than anything. 
Right. And this it seems like this is a time period where society as a whole was sort of making the transition. Because mm-hmm. like today, if you find a cool, you know, you find a T-Rex skull in your mm-hmm. backyard, that the museums get involved and people are interested. <laughs> but for a long time, it was like, oh, this is a cool, weird rock and I'll put it on my <laughs> mantle and this is a weird glitch yeah. of nature. <laughs> and this is a time period where I, I, society is starting to come mm-hmm. around to like, oh, no, these... The, to to quote a famous archaeologist, these belong in a museum. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a period of transition uh, for the field uh, as a whole. Really smack dab in that going from a hobbyist sort of uh, focus to a more professional one. Well, and it's uh, I think it's also noteworthy that someone discovering a sci- a, a obvious scientific discovery, you know, like this is important to research. And my goal is now to sell it to the researchers was not unusual back then. Like that was, there were people who that's how I make my living. You stay in the museum. I'll go hunt stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you pay me when I get back for the stuff I found. Yep. And that's still how a lot of people see it nowadays. Mm -hmm. Like that's one of the most common questions I get on tours Mm -hmm. is how much would these be worth? Mm -hmm. Yep. If, if you wanted to sell them. If I found one. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. If I found Mm this, you know, to which I go, I they. We don't have any price tags. That's not yeah. what we do. So Mary is fossil hunting, right? She now has, she it's her career. She's going up and down the coast, and she's collecting these to sell them. And she's collecting them, as you've uh, argued, I think, legitimately out of scientific curiosity that she's interested in what they are. Uh, do you know much about how she went about collecting fossils? Was she Find. I know that uh, uh, fossils would fall off the cliff mm-hmm. face over there. Yeah. Was she preparing fossils, really? What kind of stuff was she doing? You've discovered one thing that I actually kind of need to look up. <laughs> oh, sure. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know that she was, you know, kind of doing the same thing I think we do as paleontologists today, uh, especially in an area as active as the cliff sides of Lyme Regis, where you have water, you have wind, you have rock slides. So... You know, when I go out into the field now, a lot of it is looking straight at the ground and looking around and trying to see, is, is that one? Is that a fossil? Is that bone? So a lot of it is just walking around with a rock hammer trying to find out um, if what you're looking at is actually a fossil. Um, there's actually a lovely watercolor painting that might be of Mary Anning with a rock hammer in her hands, looking straight at the ground, trying to find fossils. Um, oh, which nice. I find quite charming because that's the quintessential view of a paleontologist is hat, looking down, rock hammer in hand, trying to find a new prehistoric creature, which I, I quite <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> it's one of those, the the opposite point of the more things change, the more they stay the same. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, we, I, we as paleontologists, it's been 200 years and we're still going out into the field in dirty clothes and looking at the ground and taking a rock hammer to it and trying to find something. So the actual actions of paleontology in terms of digging up fossils, I don't think it's changed much. Now, preparation methods um, have probably changed quite a bit. I (laughs) can't imagine that Mary Anning was preparing fossils in the same way we were. Um, No. (laughs) We have have technology now. (laughs) <laughs> and I've made that comment on tours because people. One of the most common questions people will ask when they come to the site is, "How do you know where to dig? Yeah, you, how do you decide? How do you pick where? Can to dig? you look in? Because they're thinking of that scene from Jurassic Park. Yep. Mm-hmm. A few more, a few more years of this technology, <laughs> yeah. and we won't even have to dig anymore. Uh-huh. And I say we we're doing it now pretty much the same way we have for two hundred years. You dig until you find something, and then you know what's there. Yeah, <laughs> there are no. We we have not yet gotten to a point where we have shortcuts mm-hmm. is just gotta look and you gotta dig yeah that part really hasn't changed which i'm kind of glad for that's the fun part right <laughs> <laughs> like i really enjoy just walking around looking at the ground and trying to see if there's a fossil it's always kind of funny because people are always a little disappointed when you tell them it's like well mainly we just look to see if bones sticking out of the ground and mm-hmm. then we dig there and I, I had one person who was on a tour it was like no, <laughs> surely it's more scientific than that. Like, surely there, there's more like technique or rules or something. <laughs> technique starts after that. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I was like, no, nope, we That's... wait for a rain. We look for bone and you dig. 
Yeah, that part hasn't changed much. <laughs> so she's finding fossils. As we said, she's in these in these Mesozoic marine rocks. So now let's let's get into some of the the juicy stuff, yeah. the meat of the episode. What did she find? Well, one of her first was when she was actually a child. Um, so her brother Joseph, um, when Mary Annie was about ten or eleven, found a uh, ichthyosaur skull. And a couple of months later, Mary Annie, Mary Annie found the rest of it. So that was one of the big ones is everybody, when people think of Mary Annie, um, even though probably the bulk of what she found was uh, small things like ammonites, belemites, that was kind of the bread and butter of her fossil shop. What we really know her for is marine reptiles. And so ichthyosaurs are definitely a part of that. And so Joseph found the skull, and then Mary Anning found the rest of it. And so ichthyosaurs are quite common in Lion Regis um, in that particular uh, sediment. And so she found an ichthyosaur um, with her brother when she was very, very young. I wish I had found an ichthyosaur when I was that young. I wish I could find an <laughs> ichthyosaur now. Um, Seriously. So, so for our listeners who don't, if anyone doesn't know, uh, ichthyosaurs are the famous marine we've talked before that there were basically three big categories in the mesozoic of marine reptiles yeah it's the one we haven't gotten to yet it is <laughs> <laughs> the the long-necked sometimes ones are the plesiosaurs <laughs> the awesome lizardy ones the sea serpenty ones are the mosasaurs the ichthyosaurs were the ones that were shaped like dolphins mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or very dolphin-like very shark-like often long noses the mm -hmm. long snouts mm -hmm. and mary anning found it was, if I, if I remember what I've read correctly, the first or one of the first ichthyosaurus yes. specimens. Yeah, so it's not the first ichthyosaur, but it's the first ichthy one of the first ichthyosaurus specimens. I know, you had to get down into the granular <laughs> detail there. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, it's the, it's the, the genus that gave yeah. the group its name. Exactly. Which is very cool. She w I think it's so cool, because, you know, I always think about Mary, as you described her, as a pioneering lady in paleontology, mm -hmm. which she's very famous for but i like that she was also a pioneering child in paleontology <laughs> there's right? been a lot of those how, how inspirational for a little kid today mm -hmm. to be like yeah no this lady this poor lady on the shore <laughs> <laughs> in lime regis 10 years old yeah. was finding the coolest yeah stuff. very 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 young and i mean they, again like we like we discussed she started young cuz you know her father died but and this was part of how her and her brother these kids are keeping their family afloat but yeah it is kind of inspiring just walking along the coastline and they're looking for little shells and whatnot and they find this whole ichthyosaur and also that they went back for it and that they realized that they found the rest because Joseph first finds the skull and Mary Annie finds the rest of it, um, which I think is really cool. Um, she's also uh, known for finding, uh, you mentioned plesiosaurs. Mm -hmm. So she also found a big old plesiosaur. And something I want to mention is like Mary Annie is actually a decently skilled scientific illustrator. I think one of Mary Annie's big contributions is she would draw her, her, some of her fossils, especially the ones that she knew were going to be important before she dug them up and like took them out. And so really oh, that wow. tradition of drawing them in situ. So there's this beautiful illustration that she made of her plesiosaur that kind of shows where all the bones are in relation to each other as she found it, which I find particularly cool. And what, what I think is part of what elevates her from just a fossil hunter to this woman is a paleontologist. Because well, wow. that kind of foresight is how, you know, new field practices and mm -hmm. new techniques get introduced to fields like paleontology mm -hmm. is someone going, you know what? I, I had the idea to do it. It didn't mess up anything else. So I <laughs> did it. And then everyone else goes, that's awesome. I, what I, I want those of other fossils too. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, we do that now mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. gray. It is a uh, still common practice when we find a new fossil, it's photographed. Yep. But it's also traditionally sketched. Mm -hmm. But that's something that, that's so cool. What she was a, a paleontologist before her time. Exactly. Yes, yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's quite a level of foresight to not only realize that you have something important, but that the fact that it's in the ground, the way it's laying out is important and that that should also mm -hmm. be recorded before you rip it out of the ground. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so that's part of what I think really you know, launches her from a fossil collector, fossil hunter, to a scientist. Um, so yeah, plesiosaurs as well. Um, and so that was 
uh, again, I, if I remember right, correct me if I'm wrong, one of the first, if not the first, scientifically described plesiosaurs. Yes. Wow. Which is so cool. Plesiosaurs, listeners, episode 72. <laughs> <laughs> These amazing, uh, it's a long, if I remember correctly, it was a long-necked plesiosaur, so this giant marine reptile with a really long neck and it's beautiful um so she also discovered one of the first pterosaurs found outside of germany very nice yeah. episode 79 yeah <laughs> and uh she also identified um some copper lights so she really really did all sorts of things in relation to marine reptiles and uh Mar uh, flying reptiles and even copper lights and how we were discussing field sketching so yeah it's it's cool to think about mary anning in relation to her big discoveries, but I think it's also cool to think about the smaller discoveries and the notes that she made in papers that she would read. I think it's really cool to think of this woman who had no real formal education, you know, as we would think about it in paleontology, um, who was thinking like a scientist and trying to understand uh, these animals. That's cool. No, like, that's great. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's fantastic because it's, it, I feel like, especially your comment that she was um, a, a pioneering kid paleontologist as well. <laughs> like, there is a kid show that is long overdue of... Oh my goodness, there is. Little Mary and her fossil discoveries. Oh, oh uh, my You heart. have to Disney it up a little bit. You know, uh -huh. no dead siblings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She I can mean, have a dead father if it's disney up. Yeah, it's, right. That's par for the course. Well, I mean, if you're Disney, it's supposed to be the mom, but you know. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's because for whatever reason... Oh my heart! But yeah, that like that would be <laughs> that would be so fantastic of having her go on little Rugrats style adventures mm -hmm. to discover new fossils. Let's pitch it. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And there... this is our idea, everyone. Don't <laughs> steal it. There are, and we could talk a bit later about it. But there are some really good resources along those mm -hmm. lines mm -hmm. that have involved Mary. So we'll we'll put a, a list in the blog post as usual, and we can ask for some recommendations at the end of the episode. So Mary has found a bunch of cool stuff. Some of the earliest ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, pterosaurs. She was a, I love that she was also one of the first people to really make a habit of collecting copper lights, which dear listeners are fossilized poop episode 30. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> which is, I, that's it. She was, she's covered all the best stuff. Mm -hmm. One well, and, and your note of the fact that it is unique for her to be recognizing the uniqueness of the thing she was finding. Coprolites, to me, is the, is the biggest example, because half the time nowadays, if you aren't a person who has studied coprolites, you don't know how to identify... Like, right. That's it, a poop-shaped rock. <laughs> exactly. Like, if you just handed me a bunch of coprolites and rocks and asked me to sort them, I'm sure I would not... I'm not sure I would get an 80% pass rating kind of thing. I am not great at identifying them either. Yeah. They're incredibly yeah. difficult. So the fact that she was picking those out way back then is awesome. It's so like, wow. She's making these amazing discoveries, which we know now are scientifically significant. What was her relationship back then, in the early 1800s, with the scientific community of her her surroundings of England and Europe? That was oh. great. Oh, oh yeah, cool. I bet she got along just... Yeah. just oh, boy. <laughs> this is the fun part. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's kind of... It's kind of strange, because on one hand, you know, as I'm sure everybody can infer Mary Annie was born during a time when women were not allowed to be part of the major geological societies in London. Uh, women were not seen as capable of uh, doing the kind of work that men could do. Most of the um, men who were part of the geological society, for example, were Anglican. So they were part of this one religious tradition. Mary Annie was actually, she, I mentioned earlier, she was quite religious. She was also what's called a dissenter. So she wasn't for, most of her life, um, she was raised as not a member of the Church of England. So she was also looked differently because of that. So she had multiple factors going against her. And, you know, she would, there were many people who would hear about her amazing fossil discoveries and wonder, how could a woman possibly do this? She must have some sort of, you know, blessing from God. Or I believe there was a letter that actually specifically said the words divine favor, uh, that there must be some right, right. some reason for her to be able to do these things. 
but yeah, she's the she's the Joan of Arc of, of paleontology. <laughs> yeah. Must have been the lightning. <laughs> yeah. And yet, uh, well, she had this very contentious relationship with geolo- with uh, the Geological Society of London when she was not able to join, and you know, just the general period typical sexism that one would find. She was also well taken care of by the scientific community. For example. Uh, there was the uh, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Birch, who was a fossil collector. He collected all sorts of things, and he met the Annings, and he was so moved by their by their plight, how poverty stricken they were, that he and how much Joseph and Mary were able to make all of these discoveries, that he actually decided to auction off his entire collection in order to make sure they could make rent and make sure they were on some sort of financial footing. And wow, wow. later, um, spoilers alert for the end of Mary Anning's life, but she was diagnosed with breast cancer um, towards the end of her life and began to lose her income because she was not able to go out on the cliff sides as much anymore. She was really struggling with her illness. And the uh, Geological Society of London actually raised funds for her care and made sure that she was provided with a stipend at the end of her life so that she would be able to be taken care of, um, despite the fact that she was no longer able to um, sell fossils at the volume that she had previously. So it's a very it's a very gray area. You have this woman who is not recognized for her scientific uh, discoveries in the way that she should be. She did become semi-famous, kind of viral, and for her uh, for her fossil discoveries. But you know, she's not given. She's not able to join the scientific community like a man would be able to. And her name's not going any on any of the stuff. Right. So when she's selling a you know a very rare fossil to a museum, the scientist who describes it as the one whose name is on the research. Um, and her name is not. And yet at the same time, her, there were many people who were willing to help her take care of her when she needed it and really provide for her. So it's a, it's weird. <laughs> um, it's not an, it's not, it's not a black and white scenario. Mm-hmm, uh, it would right. be very, very, very easy to frame it as Mary Anning against, you know, the world against the sexism of the geological society of London and the general period, typical sexism of that era. And she definitely faced that, but it's not as black and white as that. Right. It sounds like she was informally recognized. Yes. Like people sort of word of mouth knew her and recognized her skill. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. She was, she was well known. She was well known in the scientific community. Right. But it wasn't like Will said, she's not written down anywhere. Yeah. Exactly. Um, So it's a double-edged sword. She was getting recognition, but she also, it's not the sort of recognition that we would, we would say today that she would have needed. Um, Right, right. And so that's, that's kind of the struggle, you know, when we talk about these historical figures is like, you know, she was a paleontologist, she was doing all of these amazing things. And but she did face um, some discrimination quite a bit, Mm -hmm. actually. Well, it, it, it makes sense from a, um, from a completely practical point of view of like, they would have had to have been blind not to appreciate her because she was providing them with research material, you know? And so what she's doing is important, but on the flip side, she's a woman and she's in the wrong religion and And she's poor and she's poor. Uh (laughs) So I don't want to include you in my club, but I want you to keep doing what you're doing. Oh, exactly. (laughs) They loved what she could provide them with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 weird because like the, you know as made evidence by the fact that people swooped in when they she was in dire straits. Had she ever stopped because of what was going on, they would have made sure that she was able to or done something so that she would keep doing it. And they did. And they did. <laughs> yeah. But yet they're not they're not wanting to go past that. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, it's weird because it's, I like what you do. It's just unfortunate you are who you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Which is something many people still face today. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do like this um, one quote that uh, Charles Dickens actually wrote about uh, Mary Anning after she died. So she died on March 9th, uh, 1847. Weird aside, March 9th is my birthday. <laughs> oh, maybe there's some like, Paleo reincarnation. But but anyway, so Charles Dickens actually wrote after her de- uh, death. He, he was quoted as saying, 
The Carpenter's, Carpenter's Daughter has won a name for herself, and she has deserved to win it. Oh, that's nice. nice. Yeah, it's a nice epitaph. Like, I could only hope that, you know, had I lived and died at that age, that Charles Dickens would write something so nice about me. <laughs> well, that's, that's, right. that's what I was going to say, is like getting a note after your death by Charles Dickens would be like nowadays getting an aside from Oprah. Right? <laughs> like, so I, I want to take a pause from what I'm doing to acknowledge, mm-hmm. you know, so and so who just died. Like yeah. right. before I release the next Game of Thrones book, yes. I just want to let everybody know that this lady was really cool. Yeah. Like yeah. that's that's really that's really not it's notable that during that time she, she it really shows that she was getting a reputation, just not an official one. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Like, exactly. Even outside of the paleo community, people knew it just wasn't gonna go on any of the papers or in the news. Exactly. Which is Huh. And I think that that uh it's important to note, I think, that it's not just that everyone who met her happened to be a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> like Brittany said, that this is part of what society was like. Mm-hmm. She wasn't allowed in the geological yeah. society, she wasn't allowed to publish science. It just simply wasn't done. Yeah, it's it's a it's a systemic thing. Yes. Right. And so she could be recognized, but today there are barriers that, I don't want to say no longer exist, but are lessened to prevent, uh, to allow people like that to be more formally recognized. So we've gotten this this picture now of what Mary was like in her time, and we're going to take a short break, as is tradition, Mm -hmm. and when we return, let's start talking a little bit about what has happened in the years since, and what Mary has left behind for the rest of us. Legacy. So stay tuned. So we've been talking about how Mary Anning was recognized in her time. Now let's talk a bit about how Mary Anning is recognized today, which I think it's fair to say is significantly more favorably. <laughs> What let's start with the the scientific side of things, and we've touched mm-hmm. on this a yeah. little bit. What do you think are the most exciting, significant ways that Mary contributed to what we now call mm-hmm. paleontology? Part of it is definitely increasing our understanding of Southwest England. Uh, like we talked about before, the Jurassic Coast is amazing, and it's chock full of these you know ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs and all sorts of things. And I think just in that, regardless of anything else, having such a beautiful picture of that particular location and that point in time, I think is really important. Um, You know, you guys know me, I'm a mammal paleontologist uh, Mm -hmm. and I love my, I love dinosaurs too, but it's nice to have this lovely snapshot of a period in time with so many things that weren't dinosaurs, especially um, that's really contributing to the fullness of our understanding um, of this period. Um, so I think regardless of anything else, just the things that she discovered on their face value would have been important no matter what. Um, Definitely. And we discussed a little bit about field techniques and, and whatnot, but I think what Mary Anning's lasting legacy has been, has just been showing that uh, women in paleontology have been here. We've been here a while. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not a, <laughs> In a field that is often looked at as male dominated, although I do think that is changing. Um, yes. Uh, changing for the better. We are seeing increasing diversity in paleontology, not just of women, but of all sorts of individuals. Um, and so I hope that continues. And But it does kind of show that, you know, that has always been the case. Um, it's just so people who were not men, so any person who was in paleontology with some sort of marginalized identity uh, was not recognized. And now we're starting to see, okay, these people have always been here. This has always been a field that's been diverse and full of people who are making contributions um, aside from the people that we think of as like a normal paleontologist, quote unquote, I'm making the air quotation marks here very aggressively. Uh, (laughs) Well, um, it it really shows that uh, people other than old white men aren't just suddenly becoming interested <laughs> exactly. in science and paleontology. It's like, no, that they've always 
been there's always been people of in in those groups who were interested mm-hmm. they just weren't allowed to be to the extent that they wanted to be exactly i think it's as our friend michelle says on her podcast and i hope i'm getting this right and correct me if i'm wrong i believe she says women have always been a part of science but they haven't always been a part of history yes yeah mm-hmm. sorry michelle if that is incorrect <laughs> but the spirit <laughs> Uh, in that, yeah, they were there. It's just mm-hmm. they weren't being written about mm-hmm. quite as much. Yeah, and I, I think I feel like I've seen in recent years. It, it fe- seems to me, a sort of as a more casual observer, I'm not an expert on Mary Anning or science history, but that she has been gaining a renewed popularity mm-hmm. in the recent years, recent decades, and I feel like a big part of it is that it's exactly that using her as an example mm-hmm. of exactly what you're talking about that not only can people traditionally in groups that are thought of as unable to join in on paleontology or science in general not only can they do it not only can you you the audience of whatever the the message is do it but that it's part of the tradition that it's yeah. been there forever mm-hmm. yeah i think part of it is always being able to see yourself in a particular uh, particular job and a particular discipline. And so it's helpful to be able to reach back into history and show, yes, people just like you were doing it back then. They may not have gotten the recognition they deserved for it, but they were there. Um, and so I think that in addition to her unquestionable scientific legacy, I think is a a great part of Mary Anning's legacy today. And you're right. She has been increasingly recognized. I mean, we're here on a podcast talking about her right now. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I know that the natural history museum of London has Mary Anning, uh, usually an actress playing Mary Anning coming out and talking to kids about their Marine reptile hall. Uh, There's going to be a movie coming out about Mary Anning. Yes. (laughs) So and now there's a, if I remember correctly, I think there's two, I feel like there's one that's more documentary style Yes, that is either coming out or has come yeah. out. Mm-hmm. There's a documentary and then, and then there's the fiction one. Like a, a movie movie. Yeah, a movie like movie. Like a Hollywood, <laughs> yeah. Hollywood movie, which I've, I've seen a lot of preemptive cringing from people who are a little concerned Yeah, we'll uh, as, as is to be expected. We'll see. Um, yeah, I, I will be interested in it regardless. Uh, <laughs> so that is supposedly supposed to come out. Uh, this year and so i will be there with bells on but <laughs> oh yeah we'll see hey we make do a silver screen science about the mary oh, we should yeah. yeah so mary anning is being talked about quite a bit now and it's very cool to see her finally you know over much under over a century after her death to kind of get the recognition that she didn't get in life um not only for you know, her as a female paleontologist, but just as a paleontologist in general, like I said, with her scientific discoveries, those on their own would be enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It makes me wonder if cause she introduced us to ichthyosaurs in a major way, to plesiosaurs, period. <laughs> and she discovered one of the first pterosaurs in, in England. I It makes me wonder when those discoveries would have happened I assume it would have been England. Like, mm-hmm. England was the nexus of paleontology yes. for a long time. But how would that have adjusted our the trajectory mm. of paleontological study in that part of the world? This person... It, it's not like she discovered the coolest plesiosaur. She discovered the plesiosaur. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and the, hall, yeah, the, the halls of the Natural History Museum in London would be far emptier. Yes. Right, right. And I think that that's another good, important thing to note about her legacy like you mentioned there is a hall but that pays homage to her in the the museum where once in the same city they would not have acknowledged Mm -hmm. her i understand that lyme regis uh, has also gone and made a big deal out of Mm -hmm. mary these days yeah so there is a um, lyme regis museum i have not been there yet but i really really want to go the (laughs) lyme regis museum is a great spot uh there is an organization uh called mary annie rocks that's trying to get a statue of mary annie um in her hometown and you you can support that effort actually right now uh so 
Yeah, the Lyme Regis is really leaning into kind of their hometown hero, which I, I think is uh, <laughs> quite nice. That's really, that that's a cool thing to see happening. Yeah. And we've got movies, we've got documentaries. We've got books. I know that there there have been a bunch of books. Mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite Mary Anning books? So uh, one book that I've read that I would recommend is The Fossil Hunter by Shelley Emily, which was quite a good uh, nonfiction. There's also been some fiction books that have been written about Mary Annie, although I haven't uh, perused those quite yet. Uh, there's an increasing number of children's books about Mary Annie. So yeah, she's definitely being featured in the literature quite a bit. Nice. I know that recently I've heard a lot about She Found Fossils. Yes! Oh, and I love that, oh, that oh, book. Oh, Gold. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure there's a partner in that book, but I know Ohania's name, uh, which is a sort of, if I understand, geared towards a younger audience in introducing them to famous people in science, famous ladies in science. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the other author is Abigail Rosemary West. And yes. Okay. Yes. It's a, it's a great children's book about uh, women in paleontology. So that's also another option if you've got younger readers who would like to learn not only about uh, female paleontologists of history, but a female paleontologists today. Nice. And I believe that book is also in at least two languages. I've available. heard. Yes. It's also available in Spanish. Okay. Which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Because why should we English speakers have all the fun? No, yeah. We shouldn't. <laughs> Right, exactly. (laughs) And so this leads into, we're talking about books and documentaries and stuff. Do you have favorite, uh, any other favorite resources for learning more about Mary? Ooh, that's a very good question. Um, So the book I mentioned is quite good. Uh, If you just Google Mary Anning, um, her Wikipedia page is actually quite detailed. um, And that will give you quite a bit of information. Uh, The Lyme Regis Museum also has information. And um, another cool resource might be a shout out to my friend and previous guest of this podcast, uh, Michelle Barboza, yep. uh, the Femmes <laughs> of STEM podcast episode five actually kind of goes into Mary Annie. so if you like podcasts, which I assume you do, cause you're listening to this one, that's also <laughs> a good option. If you're looking for another resource about Mary Annie, but another cool podcaster. Yes. And, and indeed now is a great time to shout out to the fact that if you are interested in this broader question this broader topic of women and their role in paleontology michelle was on the podcast episode 19 talking Mm -hmm. about just that which and we talked a bit about mary anning back then and i think if i remember right that episode of her podcast she had amy and megan on Mm -hmm. who are famously the duo behind mary anning's revenge (laughs) which is another great online science resource yep Love Mary Anning's Revenge. That's a great website. I also just love the name because it makes it sound like Mary Anning has this amazing pirate ship. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it does. Right? Wow. That's great. Amy and Megan do a great job. Mm -hmm. Their website is not safe for work all the time (laughs) for anyone who... And that episode of Femmes of STEM, in case our listeners, this is important to you when you go after it, those are slightly more adult uh, (laughs) language-wise than ours. Yeah. But great information, great science communicators. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Great friends. Love them all. (laughs) So one question that in our previous Darwin Day episodes, we have talked about Darwin is uber famous. Yes. And uh, episode 28. And then we (laughs) talked about Wallace in episode 54. And we talked about how Wallace is kind of the opposite, that he is not uber famous. And we would ask our guest, Dr. Sarah Bray, how much of their fame is deserved? Where do they mm-hmm. fall? You know, do, is Darwin worth all that mm-hmm. fame? And is Wallace, how much of the underdog is he? For the answers to those, go listen to those episodes. <laughs> <laughs> and we've sort of been touching on this, all, you know, throughout the episode. But in your perspective, if you have sort of a summation to it, what do you think about the way that Mary is remembered today? Is it apt is it appropriate are we missing things is it too little is it too much which i uh, don't expect that it is <laughs> <laughs> you know i would say that mary anning uh, her legacy now and the way we think of her today um it's quite apt i think it's and it's quite well deserved i do think that um she could be more well known outside of the sphere of paleontology i don't think you will find a 
paleontologist, or hopefully you don't, a working paleontologist today who doesn't know who Mary Anning is. Um, at least they may have like a passing, a passing familiarity. But I don't know that if you just drop the name Mary Anning in the street to anybody, um, to a tech CEO in San Francisco or an auto mechanic, that they had any idea who we're talking about when we're talking about Mary Anning. And I feel like she should be more of a common name. You know, we think about uh, Mary Curie and Ada Lovelace when we think about women in science. And I would love for Mary Anning to eventually get to the point where if I just say Mary Anning, people know, oh, the first female paleontologist, of course. I learned about her in grade school in our history books. And that would be lovely. Um, and I think that would go a long way towards affecting the public perception of paleontology as a field in which it has a lot of men. Um, and so it would be nice to get to that point where when you think about a paleontologist, maybe the first person you think about is a woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> in, a, we actually, in a world. In a, yeah, right. <laughs> we actually did have, and I, I thought to mention this before, but now's a good time. A, around Mary's birthday, which mm -hmm. I don't remember when this was, but it was last year, which I think was is also the anniversary of the first time that the Royal Geological Society started admitting women as members. Around that time, we had a young lady from a nearby school, a nearby middle school, mm -hmm. who was doing a... This was sort of a, a history competition, like a nationwide history competition, where students are invited to make presentations or do some sort of performance or something about a historical figure of their choosing. And this young girl, a middle schooler named Elizabeth, had chosen to do hers on Mary oh. Anning. And she came to our museum to talk to the paleontologists and sort of learn more about it. And then she went on. I think she won states in the competition. That's awesome. For North Carolina. She came from across the border, I think. And then afterwards, she came to the museum to give her performance for our staff. That is so cool. And she... She had, she was all dressed up. She was like changing costumes throughout. She put on this English accent <gasps> and it was super cool to see this young girl who was interested. She wants to be a chemist, not a paleontologist, which is totally okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. There's chemistry and paleontology. Yeah, yeah. We'll get her eventually. <laughs> You'll work right in the labs. <laughs> You'll fit right in. Where she was super excited about this lady in science and we, she came over and we were touring her around. And I would mention the ladies that work at the site and she'd get really excited about the thought of meeting the ladies who work there now. And so it, there is the glimmers of it. Yeah. It's... That I'm, I'm hoping that's a sign of the way things are going, that she is getting more recognition. Yeah, we had something similar. Uh, my museum has a school on top of it, uh, we have a academy that also meets at the Western Science Center. And so I went out one day, I think I went to go across the way towards the school because they have a, a, a big water fountain. And I was like, I need water. So I go over there and all the kids are out with their poster displays and they had all had to pick, I think they were sixth grade, graders, and they had all had to pick a historical figure in science. So I saw a lot of Darwin's. I saw a lot of Mary Curie's. Um, but I saw more than one Mary Anning, and I was so excited. <laughs> now, That's part of that, fantastic. yeah, part of that may be because you know they're at a school that is at least somewhat associated with uh, a paleontology museum, so they'd be more likely Fair. than average to know who that is. But still, I was so excited, and they were all dressed up. And so <laughs> maybe you know it is we're just beginning to see the glimmers there. Yeah, no, it's it's exciting that. That she is, if not in some, in all households, on her way to becoming a household name. You know, as they say, like... I hope so. It's... Maybe it's cool. Kate Winslet will help. <laughs> we'll she can't see. hurt. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> that's that's not far off. Well, we've talked a lot about Mary Annie, mm -hmm. and I think we have painted a great picture. Oh, painting a picture. I wanted to mention that while I was reading about her... She also inspired what some have considered the first incidents of modern style paleo oh, art. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a great point. Really? Mm -hmm. So she had a friend whose name I don't remember off the top of my head. I might have it in my notes. Who 
was inspired by her discoveries to do this image with all the marine reptiles and, and the pterosaur, which was Pterodactylus, but then later renamed to Dimorphodon. And if you listen to our last episode, you'll know what all that means. <laughs> and he did this scene, right? This Lyme Regis scene, which I've seen described as the first widely circulated paleontological reconstruction based directly on fossil evidence. Which That's... today we would call Paleo Art, episode 64. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Like, wow. His, mm -hmm. his name was Henri de la Beche, or given the rest of his name, Henri, <laughs> I assume. <laughs> uh, and he painted, he was called Duria Antiquar, Antiquior, a more ancient Dorset. And he sold prints to raise money for Mary. Wow. That's it's a, like it's a beautiful painting. Uh, the original is a watercolor, and I was actually looking up. Um, I really want to see it, and it um, is actually the original is stored at the National Museum of Wales. And I might be going on vacation to Wales, and I was trying to find out if I could see it, but unfortunately, the water the original watercolor is so fragile that they don't put it on permanent display. Oh, okay. That makes so you sense. you need to make friends behind the scenes. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody from the National Museum of Wales is listening to this episode and wouldn't mind showing me behind the scenes in a little bit, call me. Yeah. <laughs> this is it. This is your platform. <laughs> <laughs> so before we wrap up, after a, an episode talking about one of the, the super coolest ladies in paleontology, I do want to take some time to talk about a more local super cool lady in paleontology, local to this podcast and to like time. <laughs> yeah. You're several thousand miles yes. away. <laughs> but can you tell us a bit about what you do? So yeah. you, you are, you, you said in the beginning that you have started going to school. You're doing mm -hmm. research. Yep. But I've known you for a little while now as a fellow science communicator. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that's like my official job. Um, I do outreach uh, marketing events, social media, whatever they have me do at the Western Science Center. Like I said, it's a natural history museum in Hemet, and we're all about mastodons. Um, so science communication is really my job. The research is kind of on the side, my schooling's on the side, but my bread and butter is really museum science education and that sort of thing. And so that's what I do with my day-to-day. -day. Um, like I said, I do do research on mammal paleontology for right now, although who knows what the future holds. I'm also, part of the reason I was so excited to talk about this podcast was I am also very interested in the history of science. Um, if people have uh, know of me, they might know that I uh, was an English major in college, so I've had a bit of a different career trajectory to most paleontologists, and so that part of me is still active. I still really think about uh, literature and history, and so that's something I'm still interested in, and so I was very eager to talk about Mary Anning and her place in the history of science, especially. Well, we were very excited to have you. I know that one of the first things that here, this is a little bit of story time, <laughs> but I remember one of the first things that Brittany and I sort of bonded over as fellow science communicators was we met at SVP mm -hmm. in Calgary. It right? was Calgary. Yes, it was. It was Calgary. And we, we sort of bonded over this question of not knowing what to call ourselves because yeah. <laughs> I had been on the research track mm -hmm. for years and then I had moved off of it into SciComm and I was kind of in that transition and you were kind of in the opposite mm -hmm. yeah. where you had been moving and moving from SciComm and then dipping my toes as a, as a baby paleo researcher into that into that <laughs> world and so yeah we were kind of we met her we met each other at the crossroads and we're like oh neither of us has the traditional trajectory um in terms of paleontological careers what do we do yeah yeah and here we are standing surrounded by a literal thousand paleontologists <laughs> kind of trying to figure out where we fit and that got us to talking about this question of what is this what fits within this broad category mm -hmm. of paleontology yeah. and who counts, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. how, what are all the different ways you can be involved in it? And I think that this episode has been a really cool demonstration of the ways that from, from Mary to you, yeah. the ways that different people can be involved. Exactly. In it. And that's what I find really inspiring about Mary Anning. Um, uh, Another cool thing is that um, I do have a ichthyosaur tattoo on my arm, 
And I mm-hmm. got it because I got it after I got accepted into grad school as sort of a one because it looked cool. <laughs> it's actually from a 19th century geology textbook of a traditional engraving of an ichthyosaur. Um, but I wow. got it. Uh, the inspiration behind it was as sort of like a talisman I could take with me as I continued my path into paleontology and to think about Marianning and other women in this field who kind of gone before me and that it was possible and that I would be able to do it and that my imposter syndrome could just go take a hike. Um, so that's <laughs> kind of what Mary Anning has personally been to me, um, especially as, you know, like we were talking about somebody who was trying to figure out what her place was in this field, knowing that there were women who had gone before me um, and had been able to make a name for themselves in this field and be able to contribute to this science was quite inspiring and something I kind of hold on to as I as I go forward. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, I don't know, that that just sums it up so perfectly. I love it. (laughs) Can you tell us a little bit about what your horse research was on? You did horses Mm -hmm. in episode 76. So, yeah, so uh, what what are you contributing to that? I am specifically looking at Miocene horses. Uh, So the horses I'm looking at are about 18 million years old. So they all have three toes. I'm specifically looking at a uh, the Cajon Valley formation here in Southern California. So I'm looking at the particular Miocene horses um, that we've found there um, and kind of doing further research on them, really understanding their place in that uh, in that faunal list. Um, so hopefully, I'm just finishing up a paper on that one. So hopefully that will be coming out reasonably soon. We'll see. <laughs> So keep your ears out for future news sections. Yeah, we can, <laughs> we can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, more more near future than distant. Wouldn't it be cool <laughs> to have a guest show up for a news bit? Yeah, to talk about their own news. Oh, oh man, fun. now you're. We'll see. Now you're really putting the pressure on. Like this is my. <laughs> oh yeah, we're really. This is my first paper. <laughs> it's not only my first first author paper, but it's my first paper entirely with my name wow. on it and so have to go through the review process and everything and it's a bit nerve-wracking but fingers crossed yeah. it'll be fine <laughs> and I, I really owe a lot of that to my co-authors who've been uh helping me on this journey for this has been about science does not happen quickly people this uh just a paper about talking <laughs> about some horses has taken about two years of research work so we're almost there and um it's been my co-authors like my co-worker dr andrew mcdonald our curator at the western science center our director dr alton dooley and um eric scott who's like the uh pinnacle of horse paleontologists in this area <laughs> um have all been really helping me and i'm really grateful that, to them for joining me on this project no uh, uh, my favorite way to explain the the time scale of stuff in paleontology is that every aspect of paleontology is tedious <laughs> and you just have to find which one is the right kind of tedious for you mm-hmm. that that's uh, incredibly for, apt <laughs> yep yeah. for for us it's answering the same questions every day uh-huh. yeah oh, yeah <laughs> wow yep you know i've never thought of it that way that's yeah. brilliant yes. <laughs> that is exactly what it is yes. <laughs> all all time when it comes to paleontology is geologic time <laughs> we we measure nothing but deep time (laughs) right (laughs) Brittany. it has been a delight to have you you on the podcast absolutely always enjoy hearing from you if our listeners have hopefully also enjoyed hearing from you where might they find you um so they can find me uh online i'm on the Twitter, the Instagram, all of those associated social media feeds um, at the at symbol Brit and Bone, B R I T T A N D B O N E. And we'll put links in our yeah. the episode description. Yeah, yeah. and um, also feel free to check out my museum. A uh, quick little plug for my place of employment, but the Western Science Center is definitely an awesome natural history museum. Uh, we've got a lot of mastodons, but we also have a lot more than that. And I am really proud of the work that we've done in the past couple of years. And we are great friends with the Gray Fossil Site. And it is a privilege to work for them. And I hope you all check them out. You can. We have a very mouthy mastodon on Twitter. So there's something for everybody at the Western Science Center. And we can say from personal experience, it, yeah, it's a cool place. Yeah, we got to visit. Yeah. The APC. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And it you know, it's it's super cool. It's Max is Max the Mastodon <laughs> for all of his gusto uh, <laughs> on the social media is pretty cool. It's very neat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brittany, thank you so much for joining us for this episode. Thank you guys. This was awesome. It's been wonderful. Listeners, thank you for listening. Thank you to the folks who requested mm-hmm. this episode topic. This has been great. We hope that everybody has a happy Darwin Day. However, you may be celebrating our nerdy biological sciencey history. <laughs> As always, we'll put links and uh, pictures and such in the blog. We'll include in the description places where you can find Brittany. We'll put plugs for the Western Science Center Thank because you. we're friends with them and they're <laughs> awesome. So check all that out. And as usual, re- we release episodes every fortnight. Mm-hmm. So stay tuned in a couple of weeks as we return to our regularly scheduled uh, me and Will talking about stuff. (laughs) And once again, thank you so much, Brittany, for being with us. Thank you, guys. This was awesome. Bye for now. See you, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.